pray with me, please? Father, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, to be able to take him at his word, to rest upon the promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. And so now, Father, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that you would allow us to submit our hearts, submit our affections, submit our thinking, that it would be captive to your word. That when we look at our lives and that when we look at the word, that we would be willing to say, thus saith the Lord. To be able to joyfully embrace it and to live it out. That's our hope this morning. For that we will need your help, so we ask for it, Father. Our hearts are also heavy this morning for the chaos and for the atrocities and the wars and rumors of wars that are again coming from the Middle East. And so we, like Christians, in so many times and across so many of the ages, pray this morning, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We're comforted to know that though the nations rage, that though kingdoms rise and fall, that there is one who sits upon the throne. That no matter what the nations may plot, they do so in vain. They cannot thwart to one degree your eternal purposes that you have determined before the ages began. And so we pray this morning, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. There's chaos, Father, not only in the Middle East, but in our culture. Chaos about what it even means to be human, about what it means to be male and female. And so as we look to your word this morning, God, help our minds to be transformed by the renewing of your word in our hearts. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Turn in your copy of the scriptures, if you would, to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. The band King Crimson once sang, Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hands of fools. We live in a time of unrivaled folly. We live in a culture where a statement like, I am a man trapped in a woman's body, elicits no shock, produces no incredulity. A statement that previous generations would have regarded as incomprehensible nonsense now seems to make perfect sense in a society where no one sets the rules. But suppose there are rules. Suppose that there are lines that we are not intended to color outside of. Suppose that there are objective truths, truths that limit and that define our humanity and that prescribe to us our meaning and purpose, truths that we do not get to create for ourselves. Suppose there are objective rules, rules for our existence, rules that we do not get to make. What happens to us then when we break them? Today we continue our study, Foundations, through the book of Genesis, and as we work our way through that book, we are in the opening movement of the book, the movement of creation. This morning we are in part two of a three-part mini-series on what it means to be human. Last week we looked at our identity as image bearers and our mission as image bearers. This morning we are looking at our gender and the roles that that gender communicates. And then next week we will be looking, God willing, at marriage and sexuality. Our text this morning then hits on a number of hot-button topics in the culture and also in the church. One of the latest movements in the ongoing sexual revolution in our culture today is the rejection, of course, of biological gender. Pervasive in our society is the idea that gender is simply a social construct, that gender is fluid, that gender is non-binary, that gender is, in fact, a personally conceived, self-determined identity. Equally significant to our culture today are the after effects of first, second, and third wave feminism that swept across our country over the last century. Movements that began by fighting for equality between the sexes, but that eventually brought us to the place 
of erasing any functional distinctions between the sexes. And so ironically, a movement that started with the goal of establishing equality for women has brought us to the place where it is now impossible for our society to define what is a woman. And sadly, though unsurprisingly, much of this cultural air that we breathe has infiltrated the church. And so we see many churches, many denominations across our society today who are embracing who are accepting, who are in fact affirming the cultural chaos that we see in the world today. Cult churches that are not only embracing the cultural chaos, but churches who perhaps are not quite there, but are subtly moving on the role distinctions between what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in the home and in the church. There's a whole spectrum of movement that is happening in the church today corresponding to the major tectonic shifts that we've seen taking place in our culture. Well, this morning we are going back to the very beginning, to a time before the fall, where there's only God with his very good world and the man and the woman who he made. Before we jump into our study this morning, I want to make two brief overarching comments that will help us as we look at the word this morning. First, I do not intend this morning to be ashamed of the word of God. If our thinking has been influenced by our culture, then we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The word does not need updating. It is we who need transforming and renewing. So if we resist, or if we resent, or if we feel perhaps some shame and embarrassment for what the Bible proclaims to be good, then the check engine light on our souls is on and it is flashing. My second commitment. We are often tempted, I think, to major on what the Bible prohibits. And there is value in that. It is important for us to confront what is wrong, what the Scripture accounts and describes as being outside of God's good intention for His creation. That is important. But I think we are sometimes guilty of losing sight of the positive vision of human flourishing that the Bible casts for our gender and our sexuality. Before the Bible is against anything, the Bible first communicates to us what God is emphatically for. And so my hope over these next two weeks is to spend the majority of our time casting the biblical vision for our manhood, for our womanhood, for marriage and sexuality. That is our goal this morning. We're still going to have plenty of opportunity to make applications that will address these sinful ways that we distort and abuse these good gifts from God. But let's be passionate not only about what the Bible condemns, But let's be passionate about what the Bible celebrates. Let's be equipped to share with our friends and our neighbors, with family members and co-workers, a biblical vision for their maleness and femaleness, a biblical vision for their marriages and sexuality that is grounded in God's goodness and the goodness of his design. Let us be for what the Bible celebrates. With that in mind, here is the big thought that we are after this morning as we reflect on gender and gender roles from the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. The good creation of the good God is good for people. That's the big thought we are after. And in pursuit of that thought, here is the main truth that we will consider from the text this morning. The created order reveals a purpose for our maleness and for our femaleness. A word that I think is helpful for us to know as we read through the biblical narrative is the word telos. Telos is is actually a Greek word. It means the ultimate end or the purpose or the final goal of something. It's, It's a word that philosophers and theologians have often used throughout the centuries because it communicates that there is a designed or intended or end goal for something. And last week we looked at how the telos, the ultimate goal of creation, is revealed in the Garden of Eden. Of a cosmic sanctuary where God reigns and rules with a world that is filled with his image bearers. The telos of creation, the purpose of creation, its ultimate aim and the purpose of Eden is going to be finally realized in what the Bible pictures for us in Revelation of a new heaven and a new earth where God reigns in a world filled with his image bearers transformed into the image of Christ. Because that is precisely where God's good creation has always been going. It is what the creation was designed for. Creation has a purpose. It has a telos. Our maleness and our femaleness have a purpose. 
They have a telos. They are pointing to something. They are going somewhere. And to understand that purpose this morning, I'd like to make nine observations from the opening two chapters of the book of Genesis related to our maleness and femaleness. We're actually going to be moving around quite a bit through these opening two chapters, covering ground that we already have gone over a little bit, and also some new ground this morning. So be ready to move around with me in the text this morning. So here's observation number one. The created world reveals a comprehensive complementarity. Now, you might be thinking, why does he immediately have to go and start using big words like that? What on earth does he mean by comprehensive complementarity? Now, that might sound like an intimidating phrase, but it really is not. Let's, let's just think about what that means. When I say complementarity, here's what I mean. I mean that each aspect of creation is designed to complement another part of creation. That's all that I mean. Comprehensively, the whole of creation, every part, each part, is designed to complement another aspect of the creation. We looked two weeks ago at how each of the first three creation days correspond to one of the final three creation days. So on day one, you remember that God forms. He separates light from the darkness. He calls the light day, and the darkness he calls night. And then on day four, God fills what he has formed. He creates stars and constellations for the measurement of time and seasons and days. On day two, God forms a division between water and sky. And then on day five, God fills. He fills the sky with the birds and the seas with all manner of marine life. On day three, God separates the earth from the waters, and then he causes plant life to grow. He forms, in other words. And then on day six, God fills the earth with living creatures, and then he creates man to reign and rule over this creation that is in the earth. We saw how each living creature was designed to thrive in an environment that had already been created for it, whether in land or in sea or in sky. Not only that, but how each creature was formed to thrive with others of its same kind so that they would be able to multiply, to flourish, and to fill the rest of the earth. And then how God prepared all kinds of plant life in order to sustain the life of the man and the woman that he made, but also how the man and woman are created to reign and rule in order to cultivate this creation. In other words, each part of creation complements another part of creation and is also complemented by others of its kind. Now, what's the point of all of that? How does that relate to our study of gender this morning? Well, we need to recognize that it is a pattern that repeats again and again and again, and a pattern that reveals the intentionality of the designer. And so my point is this. If every part of the creation intentionally reveals a complementing relationship with each other, then when we finally get to the creation of the man and the woman on day six, if we have been reading carefully, I, sh I would suggest to you that we should be expecting that these two are designed to complement each other because everything else has. That should be our expectation. In other words, they are created for complementarity like the rest of the creation. Now hold on to that word, complementarity, because we're going to come back to it at the end of the message this morning. Observation number two, we are created male and female. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then jumping down to chapter 2, verse 20, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. God's response to the aloneness of Adam is not to create another Adam. God's response is to create the woman, Eve. Eve. God does not simply duplicate his original work. She is something new. She is something different. Apparently, Adam does not possess in himself everything that he will need. He requires something, someone who is like him, but different. And the way that the Bible immediately identifies the distinguishing characteristic of what makes this new creature distinct from the first is by her gender. He is man. She is woman. 
We know this before we know her name, before we know anything else about her. Further, their maleness and their femaleness are by God's good design. He forms the man as a male. He forms the woman as a female. And notice that they are not consulted in this process. They're not asked what they would like to be. The creator forms them as he wants them. And when he has formed them, male and female, he looks at them in their maleness and their femaleness, and he looks at the rest of the creation that he has made, and he says this, they and it is very good. It's very good. So the creation of this male and female comes from the mind of the infinite, all-knowing God, the God who loves us, the God who formed us in our every particular for our good and for his glory. Observation number three. Men and women are both created in the image of God. Back to Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, we're not going to spend too much time here because we considered this in depth last week. But I do think it is important that we reiterate it, that we underline it, that we underscore it, whatever we need to do. Because we simply can't pay lip service to the fact that men and women are equal image bearers, equal in worth and dignity. We can't simply brush over that thought. We need to insist on the fact that men and women have and possess equal worth and dignity together. There's no value distinction that is made between the man and the woman. None in the text. They, they share together the divine likeness. They are together image bearers of the God who made them. Which means that any view in the church or in society or in the home, any view that subordinates or demeans or denigrates a woman or <clears throat> any person subordinates or demeans image bearers. There is simply no place in a Christian worldview. There is no place in Christian theology. There is no place in the Christian church. There is no place in Christian homes for chauvinism. It is antithetical to them being made together, male and female, in the image of God. We must insist on this. Number four, Adam and Eve are given a shared mission. I remember when Corinne and I were first married almost 10 years ago. We were dirt poor, like basically every other newlywed couple. I remember nervously checking our bank balance when I pull up to a gas station to make sure that there was actually enough money in my account to fill up the car. And I remember Corinne calling me from the checkout line of Aldi to let me know that our debit card had just been declined and that she couldn't pay for our groceries. That's not a call that any husband ever wants to get from his wife. I remember living on Velveeta-filled casseroles. I am so glad those days are over. Now I get to enjoy things like squash soup and stuff like that. It was hard. Those were some very challenging times, like many other newlyweds have gone through. But also, like many other newlyweds, we were facing the world together. We were taking on life in a way that we could only do together. As it says in Ecclesiastes 4, 11 through 12, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. In Genesis chapter 1, God gives a mission, a mission to all of humanity that is bound up in this first man and first woman. As we saw last week, it is a mission that is at the very heart of God's whole purpose for his creation. A mission to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it, to create more image bearers, to spread the garden until the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of God. That's the mission. But it is a mission that neither one of them can fulfill alone. In order to be what God has created them to be, in order to do what God has created them to do, they each need the other. And more important to our purpose this morning, they need the other to be of the opposite gender. Opposite and yet entirely aligned so that in their coming together, they can multiply image bearers. That mission requires then that they are created male and female for a purpose. Their maleness, their femaleness is not ancillary to who they are and to what they're supposed to do. It is at the very center of who they are and what they are called to be and do. 
In other words, their maleness and femaleness is an indispensable part in the mission to spread the fame of God's glory to the whole earth until it is a temple to God. That mission is centrally located in the maleness and femaleness of the first man and first woman. Observation number five. Adam is created before Eve. If I were to say to you, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, does that send a shiver of cold fear and existential dread down your spine like it does mine? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is a mnemonic device to help students remember how to perform the order of operations in order to correctly solve a math problem. First parentheses, then exponents, then multiplication, <clears throat> then division, then addition, then subtraction. Turns out that the order of operations is actually critically important. At least that's what the math people say. Who knows if we should believe them or not. Ignore it or get it wrong and you will end up getting the wrong answer. Remember a number of years ago, it was a very common thing to see all kinds of posts on Facebook where people would post these seemingly simple math problems and then enjoy watching the first 20 or so comments get the math problem completely wrong because people far removed from grade school had completely forgotten the correct order of operations and so they kept getting the wrong answer. Because you ignore the order of operations, you won't get the right solution. The order is important. Now, I'm a words guy, so I can't even begin to tell you how much it pains me to go to a mathematical analogy, and that's as deep as we're ever going to get about math from here. But the order of operations in the creation is significant. The ordering of the created order is important. And you don't have to take my word for that. We can take the Apostle Paul's word on that, which, by the way, I think is a good principle for us in our Bible study. If we want to be better at learning how to read and how to rightly apply our Bibles, then we would do well to notice how the New Testament authors read and apply their Bibles. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is speaking about the role of men and women in the church. Paul is arguing that in the church, both the roles of authority and the functions of teaching, and those are two different things, the roles of authority and the functions of teaching, where men are present, are reserved for men in the church. And as the warrant or as the proof or justification for that argument, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, here's his reason. For reason, Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, there's a lot there in that last line about the deception, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get to the fall. That's not what we're looking at this morning. But that first part, Adam was formed first, then Eve. That interests us this morning. Because Paul, writing, by the way, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he looks back at Genesis 1 and 2, and he says, there is something significant about the order of operations in the creation. Paul is, by the way, going to argue the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He does this in multiple places. He sees something critically important in the order of of creation. He tells us, Paul says, something about men and women, that Adam was formed first, then Eve. It tells us something not about their worth and value, but it tells us something about their role and function according to God's very good design. The fact that Adam was created first leads us into the next set of observations. So here's number six. Adam and Eve are both given unique, different, but complementing roles. When God plants the garden in Eden, we read in Genesis 2, verse 15, that the man is instructed to work and keep the garden. We looked at that a little bit last week. That's a task that is given to the man before the woman is created. It's given to the man before Eve shows up on the scene. Now, remember from last week that the Garden of Eden is the prototype sanctuary of God. We mentioned that the only other time that those two words are used together, work and keep, are in the book of Numbers, three places, chapter 3, chapter 8, and chapter 18 of the book of Numbers. And those words are only used in those passages to describe the work of the priests in working and keeping the purity of the tabernacle sanctuary. In other words, it is priestly language. And so here in Genesis chapter 2, it is communicating to us that Adam is being entrusted with a priestly role. He is being vested with a spiritual authority over this garden sanctuary. 
We also need to understand what the implication of the words work and keep mean. Because the word keep is not a word that just means general maintenance, like you and I keep a garden by making sure that we water it and that we you know, properly fertilize it and, and all those sorts of things. It's not just about general maintenance. The word for keep is the Hebrew word shamar. It means to keep or to watch over or to preserve or to guard. It is, in other words, a defensive word. So the man is not only given spiritual authority over this garden, but he is entrusted, he is charged with its protection and with its preservation, which interestingly implies that there is something that he will have to guard this garden from that's coming. The woman, however, when she is created later, is not given this same role of spiritual authority. She is not instructed to work and guard the garden. She is instead, as Pastor Dave read for us earlier, she is formed as a helper to the man. That is her role. And we're going to look a little bit more about what that means next week, but I just want to say here that is not an insignificant or in any way an inferior role. Just because we have different roles, again, communicates nothing about our respective value in relation to one another. It in no way diminishes the worth of the woman that she is created as the helper for the man. He cannot fulfill the creation mandate. She cannot fulfill the creation mandate and subdue the earth without her, without him. They need one another. She is his indispensable partner and companion. The uniqueness and the differences in their roles communicates nothing about their value, but it communicates everything about their function and purpose. Observation number seven. Adam is created in a different location than Eve. Last week we looked at how the creation mandate anticipates that Adam and Eve are going to need to take the borders of this garden. And they're going to need to expand it and fill the earth. If Adam is charged with working and keeping the garden and they are to fill the earth and subdue it, they are going to need to expand to push outwards the borders of this garden until the whole earth becomes a sanctuary to God. And, and that command is given not only to fill the earth, but notice it is to fill the earth and what? Subdue it. Subdue it. Which means that while the creation is very good, it still needs to be cultivated, brought more into order. It still needs to be subdued. The earth, in other words, is as of yet an untamed, undomesticated wilderness. That is the condition of the world at the first. I want to read with you now from Genesis 2, verses 5 through 9. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and that is good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now remember with me that beginning in verse 4 of chapter 2, chapter 2 is actually going back. It's rewinding and zooming in on day 6 of creation. So we're focusing back on day 6. In Genesis 2, verse 5 that we just read, we see that the cultivated plant life, the kind that springs up from a garden and that requires the work of the man to keep it, that plant life had not yet grown up because there was no man there yet to work and keep the ground. And it is in this newly created, untamed wilderness environment that God creates the man in chapter 2, verse 7. It is there from the dust of the earth that God forms him and breathes into his nostrils. The breath of life. And it's not till after God has formed the man that he then creates the garden. Notice that sequence. The man is formed in verse 7. The garden is created in verse 8. The garden does not exist before Adam does. Adam comes first. And then it is after God creates the man and after God has created the garden that Adam is placed into it. And look at how the garden is described. It's filled with trees. Trees that are both pleasing to the eye, they are aesthetically beautiful, and that are good for food. They are functionally nourishing. It is a place of precious jewels and fine gold that we saw last week. It's a paradise. It's a prototype sanctuary of God. It's a place of beauty and safety and abundance. But Adam is not from this place. He is a creature that is foreign from the untamed wilderness. And then he is placed 
in the garden. He is created outside of the protective, cultivated confines of the garden and only afterward placed into it, but not the woman. She is a creature of the garden. She is formed and knit together by God inside the protective and beautiful and cultivated borders of this garden, which, by the way, as we have just observed, has already been placed under the protective authority and spiritual oversight of the man. In other words, she is created. The first breath she takes, the first time her eyes are opened, she finds herself in a place that is already under the protection and care and cultivation of the man. That is important. Observation number eight. Adam is given authority and responsibility to lead. In the early days of creation, God names what he creates. And names are important things. After all, one of the ways that God reveals himself to his creatures throughout the biblical account is by giving them names that reveal aspects of his essence and character and nature. Names are important things. And the right to name something, and particularly the right to name creation, reflects the authority that God enjoys as the creator. But that naming stops in the middle of day three. After naming the seas and then naming the earth, God stops naming the rest of his creation. The plant life, the bird life, the animal life, they all go nameless. Because God stops naming and instead waits until he creates the man in his image. And then he allows the man, his image bearer, to enjoy the authority of reigning over creation beginning with the right to name it. Naming is an expression of authority. We already read this morning, as Pastor Dave read for us, how the man named the animals in chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. But then notice what happens when God creates and then presents the woman to the man. Verse 23 of chapter 2. Then the man said, This is at last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. He names her. Now, hear me clearly. I am not saying that the woman is like all of the other animal creatures that Adam has just named. That is not what I'm saying. Please hear me clearly. But as we discussed at length earlier, man and woman are both created in the image of God. They are therefore equal in worth and dignity. However, in naming the creatures and then in naming the woman, Adam is exercising a headship and authority that speaks to the unique leadership of his role. Observation number nine, the physical bodies of the man and the woman tell an important story. Genesis 2 verse 7, we read that God formed the man from the dust of the earth, and then we read a moment ago about how the woman is fashioned from the side of the man. I'd like to make two comments about this. First, God stands approvingly behind our physical material bodies. God took the man and he fashioned the man from the dust of the earth, and there's an appropriate word there, this idea of fashioned, because it's a word that's used later of a potter forming his clay creation. And so like a potter carefully manipulates the soil in order to create exactly what he wants, God has taken the earth and he has fashioned carefully precisely what he wanted in the physical body of the man. The man is from the dust of the earth, and that is actually where the man gets his name, because the Hebrew word for ground or earth is adama. And the man who is from the earth is Adam. He is an earthy creature. He is from the substance of the ground. And then from the side of the woman, God creates, or from the side of the man, God creates the woman. And so the man and the woman together are creations of earth and flesh who are imbued with the image of God. Heaven and earth are bound up in their frame. At the end of day six, God will look at their material bodies, their physical bodies, and he will say of them, very good. God endorses the physical bodies that he made as good gifts to us. Second, these physical bodies communicate something about our purpose. God does not create two bodies of the same kind. They are alike, but they are different in form. Their bodies are different. Which communicates powerfully about what we were each uniquely designed for as male and as female. And when you look at something that has been really well designed, you can see from its shape or from its design features what it is intended for. That's one of the marks of something that is really well fashioned. The good design of our bodies communicates something about what we are for. I love how Abigail Dodds in her book, 
atypical woman expresses this. She writes, Yet if we want to know what we've been made for, we need something that is more fixed and unchanging than our internal selves. We need Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to observe the bodies he has given us, created through him and for him. Why are hammers heavy and flat on one side? Why do books fit in your hand so nicely? Why is the bench at a piano at just the right height and the keys of the piano sized right for fingers? Why do hoses stretch long and attach to spigots? And why are women soft with breasts and arms and curved hips and feet and legs and a mind and a uterus and a monthly cycle? Why are grandmothers extra soft? You know, we do not need to bristle when we read in a text like 1 Peter chapter 3 that the woman is the weaker vessel. That in no way means that she is less valuable. It means that while he is a creature formed from dust and fashioned among the wild things and his body reflects this, that she was formed from the side of the man in the beauty and safety of the garden and under his protection and her body reflects this. That she was designed to be the helper and lover and co-image bearing, commission fulfilling partner and lifelong covenant keeping companion to the man. She was designed to fulfill the creation mandate with the man by nurturing in her own body the life of all future image bearers and the ultimate hope of mankind. The man is formed to lead and spiritually shepherd and protect, and their bodies reflect this beautiful, equal, and complementing purpose. And we can try to ignore it. We can act as though that there are no differences between what the male and female body are capable of, but our bodies reject those lies. Our bodies tell the story of God's design for our good and for his glory. So with those nine observations in our mind, what is the vision of manhood and womanhood that we can glean from these first chapters of Genesis? How could we summarize these observations into a succinct description of why we are created, male and female? Here's a stab at it. God created man and woman in his image, equal together in worth, dignity, and value. But God also created them uniquely in order to perfectly complement one another. The man was created first from the dust of the earth and entrusted with the authority to lead, to guard, and to protect. The woman was created from the man and for the man to complement, complete, and to help him. Together they are blessed by God. Together they are given a shared mission, a mission to fill the earth, subdue it, and to reign and rule over it, to multiply and be fruitful in it. And their bodies have been designed together to accomplish that glorious purpose. And if they will faithfully pursue it, then they and the creation under their rule will flourish. That is the biblical vision that we should be casting of our gender and the gender roles and the physical bodies that God has given to us. The creation reveals God's design for our good. And even though the fall has so significantly corrupted and distorted that good creation, it has not changed the fundamental fact that there is simply no path to human flourishing that will come through rejecting God's created design for men and women. It won't happen. Resenting or rejecting God's design will always result in brokenness, in broken people living broken lives filled with broken relationships. So with that in mind, I'd like to make three applications that flow from those nine observations in that summary statement. Application number one, our maleness and our femaleness is not self-determined, it is God-given. We live in a world today of so-called gender fluidity, where an individual's psychological internal sense of themselves, what's called today one's gender identity, is the only determinative factor in whether someone is a man or a woman or something else altogether. In fact, as of December of this last year, one of the leading diversity groups in our nation recognized a staggering 108 distinct operative gender identities. These include identities such as quint gender, where an individual identifies as five distinct genders at the same time. But God does not leave such op options open to humanity. He loves us too much too. He created them male 
and female. Those are the options. And they did not discover, they did not find, they did not determine their gender. They were created male and female, and they were given physical bodies that provided an objective, unchangeable, unchallengeable witness to that fact. And we cannot afford to compromise one square inch on this. Not one square inch. Because we love God and because we love the people who are made in his image. We can't afford to to move one inch on this. It may feel loving to acquiesce or to be willing to accept or even affirm. But it is the farthest thing from loving our fellow image bearers to whisper in their ear, has God really said? Because God has said. And it is our job to love enough to be willing to point hurting people to the good creation of the good God that is good for people and that is good for them. Application number two. The design for men and for women is a rich and beautiful complementarity. When it comes to the roles of men and women in the home and in the church, there are three major views in the church today. There is patriarchy, there is complementarianism, and there is egalitarianism. We are tempted sometimes, I think, to resent what the New Testament authors have to say when they describe the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. Our our hackles go up when we hear texts like authority and submission about who is instructed to teach in the church and lead in the home. I'm fully prepared to admit to you that there are some, some people who have used texts on authority and submission in order to justify a a form of male leadership that is domineering, unloving, and dishonoring. A gross distortion of what the Bible calls for. That would be patriarchy. In my view, it is wrong, it is disgusting, and it is unbiblical. We must reject it. We must call it by its right name. But also, there are many Christians, and many, many Christian authors and pastors today, who argue that Any functional distinction in the role of men and women in the home and in the church is outdated, is oppressive, and is wrong. That equality of personhood means that there can be no distinction in in role or function in the home and the church between men and women. That would be egalitarianism. That is also wrong and unbiblical. That perspective has taken in far too much of the cultural air that we breathe today. Many egalitarian Christians and pastors would seek to argue that that Paul, when he addresses these things in the New Testament, that he is addressing his particular culture. That he is writing his instructions on man and womanhood in the time and place that he was writing, but it might be different if he was giving those instructions to us today. But that conveniently ignores the fact that Paul goes back to the creation. He says it's not based upon the time in which he's writing. He says these principles reflect the timeless creation ordinances of God. Before the fall, before culture, before society, when God created everything however he wanted, and he said, this is very good. Our resistance to that design is ultimately a result of the fall. So what then should be our position? What is a biblical understanding of manhood and womanhood? We hold to the complementarian position. Here's how the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood defines complementarianism. Male and female were created by God as equal in dignity, value, and essence, and human nature, but also distinct in role, whereby the male was given responsibility of loving authority over the female, and the female was to offer willing, glad-hearted, and submissive assistance to the man. As a church, we call our position joyfully complementarian. Joyfully, because we are not ashamed to confess, embrace, and live out God's good purposes for us. We want to joyfully announce, embrace, and live out what God has ordained as right. And complementarian, because we affirm that men and women are co-image bearers, are equal in worth and dignity, and in value and in essence, but created unique in order to complete one another with different functions and roles where the man is designed to lead and protect and the woman to submit and complete and complement him. We are joyfully complementarian in the home and in the church. And this, by the way, is why we do not try to draw the lines as narrowly as possible. It's why we don't try to discover where is the edge of what's permitted. Where is the, where is the outer boundaries of where we can go in order to not break the rules. That's not what we're after. 
We're not trying to find the edge of what's permitted. We're not trying to find what, what is the edge of what's prohibited. We are trying to embrace and celebrate what is promoted. We are trying to look at the created order and say, what does God's creation reflect about our intention and the intended roles and purposes, the telos for men and women, and let's embrace and joyfully proclaim that, live that out. And we want to do that in every way that God has uniquely gifted and equipped men and women in every area that is appropriate and that satisfies God's good intention for us and that reflects the very good intention in, in, in full completion of his created order. That is what we are for. Finally, number three, our bodies are good. One of the saddest aspects of the gender confusion of our time is the animosity he has created toward the physical bodies that God has given us. Because if my internal sense of myself, of who I am and of what I am, if, if that is fundamentally at odds with my physical body, then in our culture today, it is our physical body, our biological body, that society says is in the wrong. And that creates a hatred for the body. Caitlin, formerly Bruce Jenner, wrote in the 2016 book, Secrets of My Life, that, quote, when I look into a mirror, I see a body that I fundamentally loathe. That is what the worldview of our age has done to our perception of the body God has given us. The culture today divides a person into essentially two parts, part body and part psychological self. It's a, a dualism, a division into two parts that goes back to the ancient Greeks. It's a philosophy that divides the person into two parts. And as was the case among the ancient societies, so in our culture today, the result of that dualism is a denigration of the body. Because it assumes that the physical and material part of us is of, is of less value and is less determinative to who we are than the psychological or spiritual self part of us. Which is why today when someone's psychological internal sense of themselves is misaligned with their physical body, it is the body that has to give way. The body becomes the enemy. The body becomes something that is loathed, something that is despised. Something that has to be overcome and repressed and even mutilated. Oh, what a work sin has done in our world. How much pain and brokenness is the result of our rebellion against God and our rejection of his good creation. We are not spiritual beings, spiritual selves being temporarily trapped in physical bodies. We are creations that are designed to be physically embodied. And when these bodies, these bodies we have now, bodies that are broken and corrupted by the fall, when these bodies have worn out like a garment, we will not be unclothed. We will be, as Paul says, further clothed. Clothed in glorious resurrection bodies in the eternal life to come. God has formed and fashioned our physical bodies. He called them good. And now that they are broken, he intends to redeem and renew them. And our physical bodies communicate they communicate. They shout God's glory and our purpose as image bearers made male and female, which is why the evil one hates them, and which is why he wants us to hate them too. Our bodies, though broken by the fall, the body is good. As we close this morning, I'd like to ensure that we understand this. We cannot flourish while we reject or resent that the good creation of the good God is good for people. We cannot flourish while we reject or resent our God-given bodies. We cannot flourish while we reject or resent the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. So let's be a people. Let's be a church who knows and believes and joyfully embraces that the good design of the good God is good for us. And let us be a church that in the middle of the chaos and the confusion, in the midst of the acceptance and condemnation, that we instead winsomely and unapologetically cast a biblical vision of manhood and womanhood that the Bible is emphatically for. And let's do it with all of the love, and with all of the relationship, and with all of the grace, and with certainly all of the truth that God has given to us for our good and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we already sang this morning that in these times we live in, we will praise the Lord. Well, Father, you have caused us to live in interesting times. 
And so the question that is before us, will we seek to accommodate ourselves and our affections and our thinking to the spirit of the age? Will we be susceptible to the deceptions and lies that the evil one has so widely cast abroad, the dispersions upon the goodness and the good gifts that you have given to us? Or will we instead cling wholeheartedly to what you have called very good? And not only cling to it for ourselves, but be willing to share, to be able to witness and testify and unapologetically and lovingly confess and proclaim your goodness to others who are being broken by the deceitfulness of sin. Oh God, in these times we live in, may we in everything that we do praise the Lord. In Christ's name.